This is saying that's important. Ram says, What is he talking about? We mentioned this in the recent share on Shabbos. So there's when you when you first reap the grain, you saw grain growing. Have you ever seen wild grain growing? So you cut it at the stalk. Basically, the food's on top. Most of that stalk that's going away. So you have to do all that winnowing. You have to do the threshing and the winning, the, the borer stages and throw up into the wind. That's to remove what's called the chaff. The chaff that surrounds the individual grains is entirely inedible. That's not a food substance. It's a waste product. That's that's basically trying to get rid of it. What you're left with is just the grains themselves. But the grains have the outer bran, okay? What's called the bran. So that part you can either remove also, and then you'll get just the endosperm, the white stuff. When you grind that, you get white flour. Or you could grind these grains as whole, and you get whole grain flour. So he says here, you can, you can actually, with little tamba mine, you can actually roll them around a little bit in water in order to remove this outer part. The tochanino tambiyad, and then you could then you could grind it. Why? Solet, just like we grind up solet. That's the pure endosperm. They already have minog not to use this water this dispensation. Instead, you know, they just do without. That way, it doesn't let's say stay in the wet and then the water gets in. And by the way, we point out this has to be the case that really, according to Allah, this is true. Why? Because let's say it rained the day before you reap the flower. They say, Shmur Mishat's Yeah, it, it, it gets wet. Yeah. 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 But no, it has to rain on it. How do you think the wheat grows? Weed in the field. Okay, no, no, even when it's ripe, you should just know the the grain, the stuff inside the the grain that could potentially react and become hummets, doesn't know, so to speak, if it's been disconnected from the ground or not. So one day it's raining on him and things are fine. The you never have it. That grain is growing in the field. Like let's say now there's a grain field out there. It's almost ready to be reaped because now it's the time of year. Actually, the, the wheat crop is ready to be reaped, ideally around Shavuot's time. But the wheat is growing. The barley crop is ready. Barley also becomes hummus. Barley is the beginning of the of the season, right? That's the aviv. And that's the Corbin Omer. It comes from the barley. So really, the it could rain in April in Israel. It does rain. And how come that doesn't affect the grain? Sometimes it rains even as late as Shavuot around here. We had a major storm. Yeah. So, but why is it that if if the grain gets hit by water before, right before it's cut, it's fine. Yet the second it's cut, oh, it gets hit by water. The answer is la lacha. There is no difference. It's only the inner part of the grain that's not exposed to the water. That's what you have to keep dry. Which is why the Rambam says here another halacha. After we saw this one, um, where is it? I'm trying to find the exact halacha. Okay, here it says lefichach uh, amru chachamim. Therefore, the sages said, Okay? You have to be, be careful with the grain you're using for Passover to make your matzah and, and other foods. Should make sure no water hits it after it's been reaped. That's the line. That way it can't have become chametz. But in a chinami, we just saw the Rambam says over here, two halachas ago, that technically speaking, even after you... you Reap it, you could have used water to clean off the, the chaff. He says here, the grain fell into the, it was on the boat, right? And the boat sank in the river. But, you know, it's, it, this is already the kind that could become chametz. So you can't eat it, you can't keep it around. So sell it to uh, sell it to a guy and or sell it to a Jew, but make sure he gets rid of it also before Passover. So, did the Rambam say anywhere here, to my knowledge, they say that during the majority of the festival, your matzah doesn't have to be shmura, but for the night of Passover, the first night, aside from having, it has to be matzot and lechem oni, it also has to be shmura, shmura mishas ktsira. The Rambam seems to say that, technically speaking, shmura is an ideal all Passover long, but technically speaking, mekra din, not necessary. So it's a later chumra that the matzah you eat the night of the Seder should have this shmura aspect. Shmura mishas, mishas 
But in Akinami, the even as late as the Shulchan Aruch, we find Poskum said that let's say you had no shmura flour whatsoever, not even flour. You just had regular flour. You know that this regular flour, it would rise when you mix with water. Normally, it rises. Let's say you make your bread every week. Well, we make bread every Shabbos, so like I say every week. But technically speaking, people made bread more often. You know, they they had to. They had to. Well, they made it every day, basically. So the the bread that the flour that you're using to make your regular bread. Because you know it could become chametz means it has not become chametz yet, even if you didn't treat it with this level of stringency, sure, shmur mishas katsira, and or you didn't do the blila part. Uh, sorry, the yeah, the, this part it's called blila, you know, with mix, helping get the chaff off, used a little water. Even if you did that, technically speaking, the resultant flour is still eligible to make matzahs. Why? Because it become chametz. That's usually the standard. What can you use to make matzah? That which can become comments. Okay. So does that answer the question? Um, I hope so. Yeah. Flour that we have no idea. After it's made into flour, and somehow they wash it. Can you wash flour? No, they're not talking about. They're talking about the grains. They're talking about a process similar to this, bleaching. You know, what's the bleaching process here? I'll show you here. It, it doesn't it can't become it doesn't stay flour yes okay obviously they're talking about a different stage here bleaching the flour i'll show you over here there's some good demonstrations of these things Yeah, they use stuff here. They just have a demonstration. See a video of it. You know, I haven't seen it. Okay, whatever. We'll, we'll look for it next time. We saw a video uh, a few uh, last year about how they make uh, matzo, uh, rice cakes, right? Basically, the machines that make rice cakes can also use all other sorts of high-carbohydrate foods like corn and uh, kasha, like buckwheat, and even wheat. The puffer machine basically turns like, like a spoonful of grain, whatever it is, or kidney is, in about a second and a half, it turns it into a rice cake. Have you ever seen how that's done? It's quite amazing. They have machines that do it here in, in the country also. You can see it. So it just goes to show you that rice cakes and other such kidney cakes made from puffed material that's made into a disc, those are all halakhli matzo. In that, that if they used water, they were finished cooking so fast. There's not even a kneading process. It's just instantly made into a food stuff without water. It doesn't sit. It, it's dry, and it's cooked in uh, this pressure thing, this steam pressure chamber that's shaped like the, the rice cake. Spoonful of rice goes in, pops out a disc. And it's already fully cooked. Instant cooking. Yeah, well, you should know, they, they do sell... Uh, kosher for Pesach rice cakes and the like a lot in this country, and they sell them downstairs even. So I buy those before Passover. They're very good. And they say, but the locally kidneys build out. So just know the the Rama and the Chayodim would eat rice cakes. I mean, I don't know if they did eat rice cakes. I just know that they would accept. They were they were mafkir for the minute of kidneys, and they permit rice cakes on Passover well, for a number of reasons that we've discussed before. Okay, let's get back to. Uh, People think that they you know, tell them the classic posik would allow such a thing, and they know they have to say the posik was just as machmir as I am, I and myself. I don't eat a rice cake, so of course the ramad wouldn't wouldn't eat a rice cake. Okay, I guess if that's that's the way you want to be. Let's see. You know, Dafka eating shmur matzah the night of Pesach, but not having to have shmur matzah the rest of Pesach doesn't really make much sense. If it's because of kashras, so the standard should be kept all Passover long. And if it's because there's a mitzvah specifically to eat shmur matzah, then you have to prove it. So they say, ushmartimus and matzos. The matzahs that you do for the Seder have to be more shamur than the rest of the matzahs you eat all, all year, uh, all festival long. A little bit weak because you think that such an idea would have been 
mentioned by Hoskim Rishonim before that, like the Rambam, but he doesn't. So usually that's the argument from omission. Well, it's a better way to do it. So on Passover the first night, someone said that that's where the idea of not one of the uh, hypotheses regarding the spread of the Chumr not to eat matzah shira period started from that first night where it became what? Don't eat matzah shira because you did, can't discharge your obligation. Then don't make matzah shira period. Don't ever eat matzah shira. You know, things get out of hand. So too, there are those who suggested the idea of not eating the brachts, matzah that's been wedded or shruyah here in Israel. Remember, the, the secretary later at, at, the, at the yeshiva asked me if I eat shruyah on, on Pesach. And I said, what's shruya? Like, you know, matzah that, you know, they make matzah products. Oh, what's called the brox. The brox is, is uh, medieval German that became Yiddish, meaning for broken. The brox means the bro broken. That they, because they break up the matzah into a, a flour. They regrind the matzah into flour, and they use that for things. So in Hebrew, it's called shruya. Shruya literally means soaked. Not all what we call the brox. It's not, they're not, they're not exactly the same thing, but they're getting at using matzah once again in the cooking process with liquids to make something else. So the whole thing with Gabrox obviously is out of hand because it assumes against the reality that once wheat products, whether wheat in, in flour or dough or whatever it is, has reached a certain temperature, it's been denatured and it cannot become leaven beyond that ever again. Aside from that, what if you're, so don't mix it with water. What if you're a Gabrox product also using matzah that was technically lechemoni, but you're going to now mix it only with fruit juices, oils, and eggs, for example. So it can't become chametz anyways, but they avoid that. Could it be connected to the gra that it's a mitzvah to eat matzah all seven? If I don't fill the mitzvah on the first night, then I should eat shmirah all seven. That's not just the gra, by the way. It's the rambam. So the, uh, and the briskers said it means as a kiyumis as, as part, as opposed to chiyuvis. It's not exactly connected to that because the rest of the holiday, there's no mitzvah to eat lechemoni. Yeah. And that's why, by the way, this is where I disagree with Rabbi Barachim, who he holds like the Makel opinion, the Rabbi Tom's opinion that says, Hoel, that the only matzah that you could use the night of Passover is lechemoni. That's what you used to discharge, discharge your obligation. You could eat matzah ashira Erev Pesach. The only thing that's forbidden on Leil Erev Pesach is the matzah you could use to discharge your obligation. So matzah ashira of all its different kinds is allowed, even on Erev Pesach. So the Gron, the Rambam, hold all types of matzah are forbidden on Erev Pesach. All. Doesn't matter matzah, shira, lechemoni, which type. All forms of unleavened bread or pas. Pas is the better example because pas includes bread and cookies and crackers. You know, basically wheat products that are made with things other than water. So that's all forbidden on Erev Pesach. So too, that's what you should be eating all, all seven days. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the, what, what they say you can't eat on Erev Pesach is what you would technically eat all uh, Pesach long. By the way, that's another thing. So the rabbi, I think, holds like Rabbeinu Tom. But what I do know is maybe I'm mistaken about that. But one of the things he did come out and say is that the prohibition of eating matzah, Erev Pesach, only starts when the prohibition of eating comets kicks in with the fourth hour. Like at 1030 in the morning on, on uh, Pes Erev Passover, okay? Passover Eve, that's when you have to stop eating the plummets, and by an hour later, you have to burn it, right? Get rid of it. Normally, you get rid of it and stop eating it well in advance, but I'm saying that's that's a cutoff point, around 10.30 in the morning. That's usually when it comes out. I think it's going to come out that way this year also. So the there are Rishonim who say that it must be, Misvara, that the prohibition of eating matzah or Pesach kicks in once the prohibition of eating plummets kicks, kicks in. But the Rambam and the Grud disagree with that also, and so the Zohar, they say the prohibition is all day long from basically dawn until when pe Passover starts. That's when you shouldn't be eating matzah. So even for breakfast, when you're eating comets, you should not be eating anything that's halakhli matzah. And there's a big nafkamina. You shouldn't eat cookies. If you're going to eat, why shouldn't you eat cookies? You could eat a, a sandwich. You can make yourself an omelet or a, a lox on a bagel at 9 o'clock in the morning, Eric Pesach, and eat that bagel because that's comets. But you cannot eat a halakhli cookie that's made without water because even... It was, even if it wasn't made kosher for Passover, you weren't trying to avoid having it leavened. The fact that it has no water in the mix, it's halachically a matzah shira, and that's the kind of grow. And the Rambam would say you should not be eating on Arab Pesach because it's included in the prohibition. Okay, this is a very. Uh, I think this is the, an astounding sugya. I tried to offer this 
to anybody who would listen that this sugi is also connected to a uh, very important like what is the Talmudic source for this prohibition of not eating matzah and it's basically connected to Yom Kippur we've discussed this in years past which also means that just like there's an idea of Tosef as Yom Kippur so there's an idea of Tosef as Pesach which just like Yom Kippur what does it mean Yom Kippur says the day before Yom Kippur is like Yom Kippur it's connected to Yom Kippur in what way you're supposed to do the opposite on Erev Yom Kippur, what you do on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, you don't eat. So there's a mitzvah, because I'll say, it's a mitzvah to eat on Erev Yom Kippur. But they also say that Erev Yom Kippur, the mitzvah of Yom Kippur actually kicks in early. You have to stop the eating while it's still the ninth day and not the well, on the tenth. So on, there's two aspects of not Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur means no eating. Therefore, all day on the ninth, do the opposite, but also do some Yom Kippur towards the end of the ninth. So too, if it's matzah is directly analogous, which is my, my claim, so because the mitzvah is to eat matzah on the night of the festival and then continuing into the festival, don't do it the day before the festival, but right as the festival starting, when the, you know, tosefis of the festival, whenever you accept the yontif, that's when the mitzvah to eat matzah starts. And there also, that's based, Rashi seems to imply that. That's implied in the Rambam in one place also. Rashi and the Rambam seem to say that. I'm trying to point this out. But eating korban Pesach is dafka after uh, shkia, and for those who are tummy, it's after nightfall. Either way, so th- these are very interesting sugyas. Let's get back to Korban Pesach. I get very excited about that for some reason. Try to convince everybody. So, in answer to the question, if I don't fill the mitzvah on the first night, then I should eat shmura all seven. Technically, no, we never saw such thing. And the implication is that when it comes to this extension of the mitzvah to eat matzah all seven days, we don't require lechem only, except in one example. Hold on, th- this is important. Rav Kapach and others have a duke in the Rambam that not just the bracha at the Seder should be said on a matzah that's broken, normally of Lechem Mishnah, so the bread should be whole on Shabbos and Yontif. When it comes to Passover, you'd have to say the bracha on a matzah that's broken. Derech Ani Befrusa. The Ani doesn't even have a full loaf of bread on which to recite his blessing. It's the way of an Ani, the poor guy, to eat you know, a broken bread already. So too, when we when we recite the blessing on the matzah, the matzah's already been broken. Yachatz. Or even if you have Korban Pesach, you're not doing Yachatz. Or like Rambam, there's no Yachatz at the beginning. It's right before you eat the matzo. Either way, maybe you should have a Shlema with Korban Pesach, right? There's no reason to you know hide some for later. There's no Afikomen. Even then, you're supposed to first break the matzo and then say the blessing. So too, even if you're having Lech and Mishnah on Shabbos Lomoid or the seventh day of Passover, you're supposed to make sure to recite the blessing on a matzo that's broken. The Lech and Mishnah, but it's broken. Okay? Derech Haniyah Bruce and that's that's a fulfillment of Lechem Oni, the rest of Passover. Okay? That's another shot in Oni. Yeah, yeah, for those who say that in the Rambam. Okay? But it's not about Matzah Shiro, unfortunately. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.